Thank you for the applause in advance. That's dangerous. I hope not to disappoint you. <laughs> that you can give an applause at the end as well. <laughs> Thanks very much for the invitation to Gültin as the generous and scientific host of this affair. And of course to Hans, who is the, um, how, how did you call it, Frank? He is the, um, the, the holder of the power or something here. Well, in any event, many thanks. I'm very glad to be here again with you and to share with you some thoughts, always, in my case, concerning law, because I'm a lawyer and law professor, which is, of course, not a contradiction to, to anarchism. Now, this topic is war and peace, a currently um, well-known topic, unfortunately, and the law, and the law. This is what, what interests me. Um, war and peace is such, as we all know, there is an interesting or a, a close correlation to, you know, what, what we are interested in. War is a speciality of states. That's a USP of states, so to speak. Wars make states, and states make war. This is very typical in history. Um, on the other hand, the consequence out of that would be no states, no war, or anarchy makes peace. To put it very simplified, of course, no states, no war is very much simplified. There are gang wars, or you know, um, forceful, violent disputes, things like that. Of course, we are not in paradise, but I would say in those states, much less war, or even no war. War in the really, you know, um, devastating sense. But now especially, what is the, ro <coughs> the role of law? This is what I'm going to share with you in the next half hour. I have to look at the watch, five past, five past twelve, and should be, should be sufficient. Let's try. What, what, what I want to try to show is that this political sentence here, <coughs> no state, no war, anarchy makes peace, that this is also supported by law that this is not just a political or philosophical or economic um, um, saying, but also a legal one. War and peace, you all think about the famous novel by Tolstoy, War and Peace, that beautiful, great um, uh, novel um, told from the Russian side, of course, the right side, Tsar Alexander I, Romanov, um, Russian society, it starts with Russian families, France is far away, everybody is fascinated by France, they all speak French in the Russian nobility, but they are happy that it's far away, it's dangerous, it's fascinating also. <coughs> And then during these four volumes of this wonderful um, novel, France comes closer and closer, and of course the, the, the war becomes more specific. That war in the beginning of the 19th century, um, this is the big attack then that comes from the liberal, from the um, from Napoleon who brings liberty, you know, by weapons, by blood and cannons. This is the story you maybe think about once we talk about. And now <coughs> a told story in that novel says something very general about the law. He says, he says this. The actions of men are subject to general immutable laws expressed in statistics. Maybe these are these very general regularities we discussed yesterday and always at this conference. Uh, um, interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, some parallels also to the speech we just had from, from uh, 
my previous speaker. These general immutable laws on the one side and now on the other side, but what is man's responsibility to society? Responsibility, the conception of which results from the conception of freedom. Responsibility has to do with freedom. You have a free will to decide this way and not the other way. And as a consequence, you have to bear <coughs> liability. So this has to do with freedom, but now what is the relation between those immutable laws that are there, that, that um, control, that they influence everything on the one side, and these personal legal responsibilities of, of the single individual on the other hand. And that, he says, is a question of jurisprudence. So that's why I'm interested in that. Um, uh, here we have a two days novel. Um, actually, we, we can, you know, um, unfortunately um, have some, some parallels here. This big attack, uh, let's call it quite simplified a war. Others call it a military operation. Um, so, but here actually we have this this the same aspect of general immutable laws that are there in this world, in, in, in human society, and what about personal responsibility? Uh, let's now apply this question of, or this aspect of, what are these general immutable laws? Very general, uh, such as Pantarei, everything flows. This is not just a coincidence, it's maybe some of these um, general immutable laws that it's not static what, what we live in, but it's dynamic. That there are out of this reciprocal incompatibilities of elements that the physicists say actio equals reactio, mutual impacts of things. Collisions, actio, reactio, lead to changes. So within this Pantare context, changes are going on. And now, what are the responsibilities of, you know, the individuals, these questions of jurisprudence, here we think about in, within such collisions, subjective articulations of outrage, uh, uh, crying out, the victim that claims responsibility of the perpetrator, the roles of victim and perpetrator the roles of aggressor and defender. Who is who? Maybe, that, that's the question. If there is a mutual incompatibility, who is the aggressor, who is the defender? Um, this leads to something I would call now, for purpose of this speech, as the red line principle. I think this is something that, that has to do with this question, where it, it switches into personal responsibility has to do with this red line principle. Red line principle to apply just on a regular legal case, um, conflicts between private entities. We have these, you know, these entities, some persons, some small groups, some bigger, bigger entities, some smaller, but um, in principle we have autonomous entities in a social uh, environment. Uh, this is quite now interesting parallel to the speech we had before. Um, these are the subject of the classic private law. And now there are lines, not red lines, I put them blue. In case there are no crossings of lines, they are blue, they are okay. This is the, the area of each, each the surroundings, his, his area of, of intimacy, of, of, of selfness, things like that. So the body, of course, as we heard several times, but also 
own belongings, things like that. This is the basic structure, actually, of private law society. Uh, I, I, I thought that this wall you see around the picture, around the picture, this wall with the PFS symbol, with the logo, is, is, is nicely made, actually. Um, it shows, you know, here around. Actually, that's that's the picture of the private law society. Uh, beside these red line crossings, but actually, I do not know whether that was the intention um, of the marketing of the PFS uh, organization. Uh, of, of course, of course. <laughs> And namely that you didn't put them, you know, close together. They all have some gap between, you know. This gives this, this um, that everybody is, has his, his territory, so to speak. It, it's nicely uh, shown on this uh, wall. And whenever, even if there is no presentation, you always have the picture of private law society before your eyes. But now, let's go back to... <coughs> this question, what happens when such a line is crossed? Then it becomes red. These blue lines become red once they are crossed and that's the answer of who is the aggressor and who is the defender. By aggression, by killing, by violating, harming, damaging, stealing, defrauding, all these things. Within this um, private law society, of course, that's not paradise. Uh, conflicts um, um, are committed there. But now, as a reaction of law, it says that's a crime. And when once that's a crime, private law or criminal law um, provides for reactions. Actio equals reactio. It forbids aggression. It allows defense, forceful defense, even against aggression. It awards damages. It pillories the aggressor. This is how the red line principle works in very simple uh, private law situation. In short, stop crime is the uh, natural reaction. It's the outcome of these general immutable laws, the outcry stop crime. And this means again that our beautiful private law society is not paradise as I said. There are some red arrows in it but as we have seen now always combined with the immediate reaction stop crime so that these reactions in the details of interpersonal relations are inbuilt so to speak, and um, leads to um, mechanisms of conflict um, um, resolutions that are not dependent on any upper instance that implements it. Stop crime. Now the same on the level of the states. Here we have these entities, these are also more or less autonomous entities in the global environment um, and these are the subjects of international law not of private law and here too in the outset we have these um, first blue lines and now we uh, look at what about the case where they become red where these lines are crossed where this state, for instance, crosses the red line, the line that becomes then red against the other state with aggression, killing, violating, bombing, devastating um, um, attack against that other country. We call that war. The other case, we call, it, call that crime on the pri pri uh, private level. Here we call it war. The reaction doesn't come primarily from private or criminal law, but from international law, but with actually the same or similar um, remedies. It forbids aggression, allows defense, imposes economic sanctions, as we know, pillories the aggressor. 
and in short, stop war is the um, saying. Um, so here, that old story, Tolstoy's story, crossing the red line as a reaction, stop war. That's very beautiful in, in that in that novel. How how this goes, you know, to east and then it comes back. How how. Um, namely the chief commander of the Russian army avoids the immediate clash and he retreats. He, he lures, in a way, the, the French um, into this, this wide country of, of Russia. He even goes behind Moscow so that, that Napoleon comes into Moscow and then he, he doesn't find the final battle, he doesn't find anybody to negotiate a peace agreement and he has sort of flee back, you know, um, because the long winter is come and he will lose that way. And in a way it's, um, it's, it's also this reaction um, um, made, influenced by those general immutable laws that are inbuilt in behavior of, of human society. Uh, in this case, there is also a diagonal arrow, to be precise, so to speak, because these triangles is not just, you know, a country, a population, it's, it's a hierarchy. It's, it's the Tsar on the top, there are generals, soldiers, but there are civilian population, and they too are attacked by these uh, war um, um, uh, aggression and that's why stop war comes from both sides. It comes in this horizontal but also in this diagonal way. Or the same actually we have in this current case we have um, this, this general reaction stop war that comes not only on this, so to speak, official and military level, but also very um, impressively from the um, Ukrainian civil population that, that is a, a bad um, victim here of this attack. So this leads now to become a bit, a bit theoretical, a bit abstract, to a chart um, that we have these two levels. We have the upper level where state versus state is concerned. We have, um, once there is this aggression, the red arrow, we have automatically, so to speak, this blue reactive arrows, top war. Um, the same from the bottom side, diagonally. Um, and we have a, a similar or even identical um, situation just on a smaller level, on this uh, individual level between individuals, stop crime is there, the saying, uh, be it that this crime is committed in the context of a war, which is of course often the case, but also irrespective of any war situation. Um, the situation that, as I told before, on that level, even if it's a private law society, it's not paradise and we have crimes there, but we have reactions against this crime. So we have this um, two-level um, aspect actually with the same general immutable laws that are active, be it on the bigger level, be it on the smaller level. Now, what is interesting, of course, and I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about that, what about the vertical relation? We did not yet look at the relation. Do you see it? Maybe it's too, it's too, too light. There is a, a light gray arrow between the state and his individuals, you know, a vertical line. What about, what about that relation? Could be an interesting question. Maybe it has nothing to do with war. If you look at this now, we have states, 
we have individuals. We have, where the states are concerned, we, we met them before, these autonomous entities in a global environment, subjects of international law. And in the bottom part, autonomous entities in the social environment, subjects of private law. And now, what about, what, what about the lines between these um, two levels? What does the state concerning this, at the moment, blue line that, that goes then back to this individual level? You all know what it does. It's not blue at all, it's heavily red. If you look now, what is the typical activity the state, the state um, practices towards his subjects. We have many such arrows crossing many such blue lines that become red. So the whole country is full of red lines because the state intrudes into these, these private territories, I called them before, by taxation, by mandatory draft, especially in war situations by supervision, expropriation, restrictions, regulations, etc., etc., you, you name it and you, you know it. Um, so, there we have the red line principle in a very heavily uh, way um, applied or breached, however you call it. And now, as a consequence, as a reaction out of these general immutable laws, we have here not the classical private law, we do not have the international law, but we have the tradition of human rights. And this is the reaction, liberty rights, personal rights, again, what PFS stands for, you know, um, which is um, typically a defensive approach in this vertical attack uh, that takes place every day from the state to his subjects. Now, what, what is, what is the, the, blue, the blue arrow that, that comes up as a reaction? Is this now stop crime or is it stop war we had before? Is it stop crime? Once we look at what he, what he imposes on his many victims, he steals money from them by taxation, things like that. That's a crime. I mean, you know that taxes are theft and theft is a crime. So the objection against that could be stop crime. Once you look at the state, how broadly he commits his crimes in this encompassing uh, way the country wide, um, then you think of a war, so stop war. So out of these general laws comes the outcry, stop crime, stop war, or in combination now it's quite simply stop state. State is a combination of crime and war, and that should be stopped out of these uh, natural laws. So this chart must be completed. We have these red lines. Now we know there is also a very important horizontal red line. And now we have these different aspects on the trivial, <laughs> everyday perhaps, um, crime uh, level. We have this aspect, stop crime. There we have um, what states are concerned, this this war aspect and then what the state versus his subject is concerned, we have the stop state approach. So this is how these, these general laws um, are effective within this, um, within this structure we have with states, with individuals, with conflicts between states, individuals and namely between states and their um, subjects. 
or now two days novel a bit broader. This is the situation we actually have. We have, you know, all these countries, we have people, we have Russian people, Ukrainian people, but people there, people here. We have the state organizations. In the case of Russia and Ukraine, we have currently a war going on. So these specific arrows are there. They are not between others currently. Um, so in the other states, the one at the left and the one at the right, there are only these vertical arrows backwards against its subjects. Below there, we have this private and criminal law level, where, as I told, is not a paradise, but there we have these inbuilt corrections by private and criminal law. So this is two days novel. What we do not yet have are these um, blue arrows upwards that stay stop state. So if I imagine tomorrow's novel, that would be the picture of that that beside these corrections on this horizontal level um, within the civilian population um, we have big arrows upwards that say it's forbidden to um, intrude from there in the way states typically do. So these states then should disappear, should be banished by law. Um, one could say that by this general immutable law, it's forbidden to behave like a state. This means that in this charge, there is nothing up there except that principle that no sh nobody has a right to, you know, install himself over there. And we have, of course, um, on this lower level, we have this uh, legal corrections inbuilt. So that could be not, a, not paradise, I, I repeat myself, but, well, a uh, situation we, at least, we do not have the big wars. Or now, I promised, I would say at the end of my speech, I will say how this, this statement, no states, no war, anarchy makes peace, how this statement is supported also as a legal statement, and I hope that I was able to show you that it's not only a political or ethical or philosophical aspect, but also a, a legal one. So that up there, no states, no war, anarchy, and up down here, the private law society. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>